Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good night uh, to everybody who uh, joined the, the seminar today. We have another seminar on uh, bio inputs or uh, webinar on indigenous foods and their composition. And we have very great uh, presenters with us, uh, and you will see how uh, they um, present uh, the, what the indigenous people are eating and what is their impact on their health, on their nutrition, and uh, what is in the foods uh, that they have been eating for so many years. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Jon Fernandez and Anne Brunel, who will present the Global Hub on the Indigenous People's Food System, what is it and the objectives. Jennifer Mel, Drum will then do the uh, present the inventory of foods in two or three indigenous people's food systems and the availability of food composition information in inputs. Barbara Burlingham will then talk about nutrition and health of an indigenous peoples, the role of traditional foods, before Longa will conclude with the inventory of indigenous foods consumed and their composition from the northeast of India. And thereafterwards, we will have uh, 25 minutes for questions and answers. And uh, I would like to uh, ask you all to, uh, if you have any questions, to ask them in the chat or in the Q&A section. So without further ado, I would like uh, to give the floor to uh, Jon and, uh, and Anne. But Ruth, thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers. I will not be speaking, and Brunel, who is the, the co-chair of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems, will be presenting. I just wanted to say two words of, uh, of support, and perhaps to, to remember all of us of the importance of the InFoods Initiative. I think it was uh, about four or five years ago when we started collaborating to analyze Indigenous People's Foods through uh, the network of laboratories that can take, uh, can undertake macro and micro nutrient analysis. This is still in the agenda. We, we continue receiving requests uh, daily from indigenous peoples that they want to know the micro and micronutrient composition of the food. So the work that you're doing is tremendously important and uh, certainly is one of the reasons why within the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems, you are a key and essential ally and member. I'm very happy to see Barbara, Lomba, and of course you, Ruth. And with that, uh, I need to go back to the event where I was. As you know, this is the UN Permanent Forum Week. Today, at this same time, they are launching uh, the State of Indigenous People's World. And we were honored this year by uh, drafting uh, a part of that book as uh, FAO for the first time. So I just stepped out of that meeting because I wanted to support this very important seminar. And I leave you in the very able hands of Anne Brunel, who will be talking about the Global Hub, and of course of Jennifer Meldrum that will be talking about some of the research that we are doing with Indigenous peoples. Congratulations, Ruth, and my greetings to you, Longba, Barbara, and the rest of our panelists and colleagues. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ruth and Anna. Thank you, uh, John, for the nice words and for being with us, uh, even uh, with uh, the schedule and uh, the changes in the schedule. So may I give the uh, floor to Anne to present. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, John. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Jan. Uh, so I'll be very, very pleased to, to share you some insights on the work of a FAO on Indigenous Peoples, Food Systems and the Global Hub. And if you allow me, I am launching the presentation. Um, so very quickly, uh, we started working in the team in 2004 on Indigenous Peoples Foods with the voluntary guidelines on the right to adequate food. Uh, then in 2009 and 2013, the FAO Nutrition Division and Barbara Burlingham that is with us today, uh, together with the SCENE uh, Center at McGill University published two very important and, and impressive book, I must say, on indigenous people's food systems that really focus on the nutritional aspects of uh, 12 indigenous people's communities uh, across the world. 
In 2015, uh, Indigenous Caucus requested FAO to create a task force on Indigenous people's food systems. And so that is a reason why two years later, uh, together with Biodiversity International, the Indigenous uh, Partnership for Agrobiodiversity and Food Sovereignty, RUD and C4, we developed a methodology uh, to profile Indigenous people's food systems in order to target their, uh, in order to really understand their sustainability and climate resilience elements. Um, in 2018, we organized together with other organizations at FAO the first high-level expert seminar, Indigenous People's Food Systems. And the main output was the consensus on the need to create a global hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems. So I will elaborate later on this. Then in 2019, we organized an expert seminar on traditional knowledge in Indigenous Peoples Fisheries in the Arctic region. Last year in uh, October, uh, we uh, witnessed the creation, official creation of the Global Hub on Indigenous People Food Systems at the Technical Committee on Agriculture, COAG, um, of FAO. Uh, in December, we had the high-level expert seminar on Indigenous people food systems in North America. And so this year, we are undertaking the publication of a book that would be the third book after the two ones I just mentioned on Indigenous people food systems, insights on sustainability and resilience from the front line of climate change. And that will uh, like highlight eight Indigenous people food system profile that will be, uh, that have been uh, done, carried out recently. And then I will end my presentation with the first task, uh, of the Global Hub on Indigenous People's Food Systems, that is to elaborate, uh, to, uh, to coordinate, sorry, the elaboration of the white paper, uh, WIPALA paper on Indigenous People's Food Systems for the UN Food Systems Summit. So as I was saying, uh, since 2017, 18, sorry, we have been um, um, with indigenous peoples and local organizations profiling uh, 17 indigenous peoples food systems across the world that you can see identified with, uh, with the stars. And so I highlighted in blue uh, the, the eight profiles that are uh, gathered in the book that we are releasing soon. And, and you can see the Inari Sami in Finland and the Kel Tomasek in Mali that will be further uh, discussed uh, by Jennifer in her presentation. So this is the cover, uh, the draft cover, sorry, of the book that we are uh, releasing now and uh, that aim to highlight the unique and common characteristics of sustainability and climate resilience of indigenous peoples, uh, food systems, and also the drivers that affect them. So the objective of this publication is double. The first one is to acknowledge the contributions that indigenous peoples can make to achieve the sustainable development goals, but also to advocate for these contributions and food systems uh, to be taken into consideration in ongoing discussions on sustainable food systems. So as I was saying, the research approach was participatory and implemented by indigenous or local organizations that have strong ties with, uh, with the selected indigenous people's communities. Um, why these technical inputs are important for the Global Hub and that lead me to the presentation of, uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, I just wanted to highlight very briefly the, um, the methodology that have been uh, used uh, for profiling the eight uh, indigenous people's food systems. So we have been going through a series of seven uh, thematic discussions that uh, talked about tradition and trends in the food systems. We look at the local diet, the production, the sourcing of food, the role of traditional knowledge uh, in, in, the, in the food system. We also look at the sustainable use of natural resources, uh, especially on energy, water, soil, waste, uh, waste, pest and disease regulation, pollination, wide resources. We also have a look at the exchange, trade and marketing within the food systems, the market linkage and how food come, external food come into the food system as well as what is sold uh, by indigenous communities. We had a look at the seasons, climate shocks and change, 
the food systems institution and traditional uh, governance systems and how we can uh, affect the sustainability very positively. Uh, the diversity in the diet and production system. And also we have a look at young people's knowledge and perception. All of this uh, information that we uh, had the chance to ex uh, exchange with the local communities have been analyzed against five principles of sustainability that are provision of livelihoods, equity and social well-being, resources, efficiency, action to conserve, protect and enhance natural resources, responsible and effective governance mechanism and resilience of people, communities and ecosystems that is based on the 13 sharp indicators that I'm uh, highlighting uh, here now. So um, very uh, rapidly, we look at the globally autonomous and local interdependent uh, aspects of the food systems uh, and, and so all the, the, the other eight, uh, 13 uh, indicators. So, yes, so why this publication and technical um, uh, book is important for, for the unit and also for the Global Hub, and that leads me to the presentation on the Global Hub, because it is a knowledge platform uh, that brings together universities, research centers, indigenous uh, organizations and UN agencies that work on indigenous people's food systems. And so the core principle of the Global Hub is a co-construction of knowledge that builds on scientific and indigenous peoples and traditional knowledge at same level of respect and, rec and recognition. We look at the complementarity of the knowledge systems. Um, so as I said, it was launched during the 27 sessions of the FAO's Technical Committee on Agriculture last year, and it has already uh, 18 members uh, in which uh, INFOOD is a part of it. Um, so what the Global Hub is contributing uh, to, as I said, the the core, the importance of the, the, the main objective, sorry, of the Global Hub is to generate knowledge in the context of the UN Decade of Action on Nutrition to contribute to the SDGs, to the strive for zero hunger and FAO efforts in the transformation towards more sustainable food systems. And so in this context, we are currently working in order to support the 2021 uh, UN Food Systems Summit with all their policies, discussions and initiative uh, that can relate to sustainable food systems. Um, I'm thinking about the voluntary guidelines on food system and nutrition of the CFS, UNFCCC, uh, CBD in food, uh, decade of indigenous language, decade of family farming, decade of ecosystem restoration. And we are open to, of course, other policy discussions and initiatives. So you have global one minute left. Yes, thank you, Ruth. Um, the work of the Global Hub is organized uh, around four pillars of work. You have more information on the website. Um, as I said, it was created uh, during the high level expert seminar that we had in 2018. Uh, and um, I've gathered 200 participants, as you can see here. Um, and so I really finish with uh, what is the first task of the Global Hub is to coordinate the elaboration on the white paper on indigenous people's food systems. So we provided an initial draft that we circulated among the uh, database of indigenous people's organizations that we have, and we received 50 contributions either collective or individual that we integrated into a final version of the of a paper that we present to the scientific group of the UN Food System Summit. We are currently integrating the latest comments, but the way forward is uh, to translate it into French and, and Spanish and, and issue the paper. Uh, the paper provides elements of characterization of indigenous people's food systems, how they contribute to sustainability, we provide facts on how, on what indigenous peoples can bring on the path towards more sustainable food systems, and you provide recommendations for the five action tracks. And thank you very much for your attention, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne and, uh, and John, for setting the scene. So may I uh, now give the floor to Jennifer?
Yes, thank you so much, Anne, uh, for the great introduction. I'm just uh, here going to share my presentation. Uh, ah, here we are. Do you see the, the presentation slides? Um, we, you, I think you need to change the setting ah, so we see more of your. We see more now of your notes. See? Yes, now it's perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, the technical issues. Uh, so yes, uh, Anne has provided a great introduction to the context for this presentation. So I'm going to look closer into the nutritional values of foods in two of the eight uh, indigenous people's food systems that are included in, in this book that's going to be released very soon. Uh, to start, I would like to just give a very brief uh, introduction to what are indigenous people's food systems. Uh, these food systems are very diverse. They include, uh, they are generating food from many different uh, methods, including hunting, gathering, uh, wild tending, herding, cultivating, shifting, cultivating, and uh, other methods in all the diverse ecosystems of the planet. Um, and despite this uh, diversity, there are also some common characteristics that we see in indigenous people's food systems. They're generally, there is, they're subsistence oriented and closely tied to local land, water, plants, and animals. They depend upon a rich body of traditional knowledge, uh, the culture, spirituality, and cosmogony of the people. Um, we look, we see that they are more about food generation than food production in the sense that the food is a result of enhancing natural cycles and biodiversity, seasonality, maintaining ecosystem balance, uh, and a low use of external inputs. Uh, we see that they are uh, biocentric systems as opposed to anthropocentric systems as People are one part of the ecosystem and all the elements are considered sacred uh, with a spirituality in all living things. Uh, foods are carrying many dimensions in these systems that it is for nutrition, uh, but they are also medicinal, social, emotional, spiritual, and other values. So traditional foods in indigenous people's food systems include many highly nutritious and health promoting items as was well documented in uh, Fao and Sine's earlier work on indigenous people's food systems. Uh, traditional foods remain as primary dietary staples for many indigenous communities. However, their use is also declining for others because of a, a, a number of interconnected drivers, including greater connection to markets and integration in the cash economy, declining access and rights to traditional territories and resources. Disconnection from traditional knowledge systems, especially resulting from assimilative education policies, and also the shifts in values and lifestyles among younger generations. The declining use of traditional foods is in many cases associated with rising health challenges, such as non-communicable diseases, micronutrient deficiencies, and obesity. And we see that recognizing the nutritional value of indigenous people's traditional foods is a critical step towards enabling their, their role in diet quality. Many of these foods are understudied and their nutritional values are unknown to science, although they're well known uh, within the traditional knowledge systems of the people. Um, but building this scientific knowledge can be important towards integrating these foods better into uh, nutrition programs. Uh, so it is within this context that the Indigenous Peoples Unit uh, at FAO sought to analyze the nutritional roles of foods in Indigenous Peoples food systems. For this presentation, I will focus on uh, two food systems in two distinct sociocultural regions, which are the, the Inari Sami in Finland and the Kel Tamashek in Mali. Uh, the guiding questions for this analysis were, uh, which foods are important sources of my, macro and micronutrients in the food systems? And what gaps exist in knowledge about the nutritional values of foods from these food systems? 
Uh, the analysis was developed based on lists of foods that were collected in the food system profiles for the books that was described earlier by Anne. Uh, the, the food system profiles were developed through thematic discussions and focus groups and key informant interviews. Uh, so we captured lists of foods that were generated in the territories, sourced from the market and consumed by the community. We also gathered many reflections on seasonality and trends in the use of foods uh, currently and over time, among other information. Uh, for the presentation today, I cross-referenced the lists of foods to nutritional composition data that was available through national and regional databases. Uh, so for the Inari Sami, I used the, the Finale National Food Composition Database. And for the Kel Tamashek in Mali, I referred to the West African Food Composition Table that is published by FAO and InFoods. Um, I also referred to the FAO InFoods uh, Food Composition data Database for Biodiversity. Um, values were integrated from this biodiversity database. Uh, if they were not covered by the relevant national or regional database, or if they were values that were specific to the country that I was, uh, that, uh, was in focus. So the analysis uh, focused on 30 nutrients and the foods were classified as being sources or high in these nutrients following the Codex Elementarius guidelines and the reference uh, nutrient values from the EU. So first I will share the results from the Inari Sami food system. Uh, this food system profile was completed with the Nelam community, which is situated to the east of Lake Inari in the Lapland region of Finland. The food system is based on the annual migration and free grazing of reindeer, which have been domesticated for herding purposes, as well as fishing, hunting, and gathering of wild edibles. A very limited level of cultivation is also occurring for potatoes and a few vegetables. More recently, grocery stores have also been providing much of the food for the community, although they estimate that three quarters of their meat uh, comes from the indigenous food system. The Sami people's social organization and seasonal lifestyle is organized around reindeer herding. This is well exemplified as Names in the months of the local calendar have meanings related to reindeer, such as the calving month and the month of haymaking or the month of shedding reindeer hairs and the rutting month of male reindeer. Most of the community members are part of the traditional reindeer herding community called Nelavsida, uh, and the leaders are one elder and one uh, younger reindeer herder. Through the thematic discussions, a total of 25 food providing species were documented. Uh, the list of wild gathered species uh, was not completely exhaustive as certainly more mushrooms were gathered than could be identified to species, but these are the, the main and most significant traditional foods that were, that were documented by the community members. Uh, we saw that they are coming from at least five nutritionally distinct food groups uh, following the classification used in the minimum dietary diversity for women indicator. So the cross-referencing with the nutrition composition tables found that uh, 17 of the 25 species had some nutrition composition information. Uh, there were seven species for which uh, no nutrition composition data was available in the, in the Finelli or in the biodiversity database by InFoods. Uh, these are those that are shown in the photos here. So you can see that uh, most of them, all, all of the hunted poultry birds, they were not covered in these databases. There was also a wild collected mushroom and the European grayling fish that was, that was not covered. Um, there were also a few foods used in the community that had values, nutritional composition values in the InFoods biodiversity database, but that were not covered by Finelli, uh, which included some important uh, foods from reindeer, such as bone marrow, heart, and tongue. So those values were included from Canada. 
Uh, there were also values for Arctic char, moose, and milkcap mushroom that were brought in from the biodiversity database, but that were not necessarily from uh, Finland. So making use of the information that was available, this is a summary of the nutritional values of the foods that are in the Sami and Ari food system. Uh, this table is summarizing the nutrient content from various preparations for these foods and taking the maximum. So it's showing sort of mainly the potential of these foods uh, to provide these uh, micronutrients. And uh, we can see in this table that reindeer meat in particular stands out as a very important source of numerous vitamins and minerals. Uh, this meat is also appreciated for being quite lean. It has just slightly more fat than would enable it to be called uh, low fat uh, following the Codex Alimentarius guidelines. Uh, but it is well appreciated in the community for being lean and, and very nutritious. Uh, fish are also well consumed and they stand out as an important source of calcium. Among the berries, the lingonberry uh, is, it can be seen as a very important source of numerous minerals and vitamins. Though there are also, so while we see that there are these many sources of nutrients, there are also uh, many gaps in the data. So you can see that uh, highlighted in the cells here that say ND. And summarizing that across all of the 30 components that were analyzed, um, you can see that, so the, that there are many important sources of, of a lot of these micronutrients, which are in red, uh, and some are low in these nutrients, but we also are missing a lot of information. So that's the, the white bars here that show that, that we didn't have any uh, composition information for some of these uh, micronutrients, such as chloride, chromium fluoride, molybdenum, biotin, and pantothenic acid. So now we will turn to another food system in a different part of the world. Uh, this is the Kel Tamashek in the community of Araten in Gargando Circle of the Timbuktu region of Mali. The Kel Tamashek are known to have roamed in Gargando during the dry season with their livestock well before the 15th century. Traditional livelihoods are mainly based on pastoralism, milk and meat, and their byproducts are the core of the diet and income. The Kel Tamashek community self-identifies through these food items and their unique local processing methods. Milk in particular has great cultural significance. The cattle, goat, and sheep breeds farmed by the community are Sahel breeds. These breeds have traditional significance and they are also adapted to the harsh local climate and the supply of resources in the environment. Mobility is an ancestral cultural value and it is essential for the subsistence of the community because it enables a rational use of natural resources. Constant movements follow pastures and water availability. The partial sedentarization and cultivation of crops, uh, especially vegetables, is fairly recent uh, in the history of the community. Foods from the market also have a role. While 65% of the diet was estimated to come from the indigenous food system and the landscape. So the thematic discussions revealed uh, documented 25 food providing species in the system. Um, and we can see that these foods are coming from at least nine nutritionally distinct food groups. So there are some gathered fruits and vegetables, uh, many meat and milk products, poultry, eggs, uh, cultivated and wild gathered cereals, uh, cultivated tubers, uh, and some cultivated and wild collected vegetables. The coverage of these foods in the West African food composition table was quite good. Uh, two species were found 
uh, that were covered in the in foods biodiversity database, but that were not in the regional di uh, database. These were desert date and wild jute. Um, three species were not included in either database, which uh, are the ones shown in the photos here. So there were two wild collected cereals that have very small grains uh, that were not in either of the databases. And also beetroot was not covered in either of the databases, although this food certainly has some nutrition composition data available elsewhere. So this slide summarizes the nutrient values for the foods that are part of the traditional pastoral system. Uh, so it's covering the milk and meat products from different animals and the wild collected cereals, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, what is striking with this table is that there are quite a number of sources of the nutrients that were assessed. The milk and meat products basically cover all of the nutrients, while the gathered foods are also quite remarkable in their nutrient values, especially okra and jujube fruit stand out for supplying many micronutrients. Uh, the okra values here are not expressly for wild sourced okra, and since it is grown widely across West Africa, it is not really clear whether these values or how well these values are corresponding to the okra that is specifically used. Uh, by this community. Taking a look here, uh, you can see the foods that are being generated by the community through more settled agricultural activities. We see that there are also many important sources of the different nutrients coming from these agricultural activities. Um, what can catch some attention is the less impressive nutrient content of the cultivated vegetables as compared to those that were being uh, wild sourced. And we see that there's a trend in the, the community towards selling more and more of their milk and meat and relying more on these cultivated foods and market sourced foods. Um, so the consequences for their nutrition merits more attention. This is the overview of the coverage of nutrients in the food system. And uh, we can see that there are many good sources of most of the nutrients, uh, but there are also gaps in knowledge that could be filled to help inform local nutrition strategies. Uh, so in reflecting on this analysis, uh, I can say that these 30 nutritional values are really just a beginning as many more nutrients are relevant to be explored, uh, such as fatty acids or specific amino acids and various bioactive compounds. Um, it is also important to note that the nutrient values of these foods do not imply that they are available or consumed in sufficient quantities to enable uh, realizing the recommended intake levels. Um, unfortunately, we don't have detailed dietary data to, to convey really the, the status of these micronutrients in the population. Uh, the knowledge of the nutritional value of these foods, though, can be important to inspire and inform local strategies to enhance their role in diet quality. Um, it's also important to, to highlight that, of course, in addition to the nutritional values, uh, these foods also encompass values uh, that go beyond nutrition, such as for food sovereignty, resilience, medicinal values, cultural, social, and spiritual values that should be taken into account uh, in any local strategies for, uh, for nutrition. Uh, so I saw that the national and regional nutrition composition databases were quite comprehensive although some important foods were not covered. Um, and integrating these missing foods into these databases can encourage greater awareness and uh, the role of indigenous foods in supporting nutrition outcomes. So for example, the Finelli database aims to support Finnish consumers in their dietary choices. Their website says that users can apply this online service to monitor their own food consumption and use it to calculate their nutrition intake. 
So extending the coverage of this database to some of the Indigenous foods that uh, were not included could enable Sami people to utilize this tool uh, more effectively. And the and as we saw the, the role of the InFoods Biodiversity Database in filling some of the gaps in this analysis, uh, we can see that the global databases on Indigenous peoples' food systems are extremely valuable and their development should be continued and expanded to include the biodiversity of food and all of its properties, as well as cultural diversity and uh, related conservation efforts. So I have many people to thank for, for this information, though, especially those who, who developed the, the food system profiles and also some uh, FAO colleagues, uh, especially Anandi and Anne, also Ruth, thank you for your help with this presentation. Um, I look forward to discuss with you more about the results in the, the question period. Thank you, Jennifer, for a very nice presentation. Yeah. So it's nice to see how nutritious these uh, indigenous foods are. And if we replace them by more cultivated um, fruits and vegetables, we will make a big uh, difference in the nutrient uh, adequacy of these people. And uh, like we have seen so many times in, uh, in the literature. And uh, I'm also pleased to see that uh, the West African food composition table that we really created with the uh, aim of including as much as possible by diverse food. So uh, I'm happy that uh, we were better than the, the Finnish one. <laughs> so, so that's good. And uh, yeah, there will be a lot of more questions and, uh, and comments and uh, before um, that one, I would like to go and give the floor to Barbara. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here talking about this subject that I, um, that I enjoy, and it's very close to my heart for uh, many, many years. Uh, in fact, the very first work I did on biodiversity for food and nutrition was in the 80s in uh, New Zealand, looking at uh, the nutrient composition of traditional Maori foods. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, sorry. Let's see, share screen. Okay, sorry, let me go back. <clears throat> uh, I'm having trouble, Ruth. The uh, share screen is on the bottom, the green button. Okay, just a moment. You did very okay. well in the practice. So it's on, <laughs> yes. And now we need to see your presentation. Yes, so we see okay. the presentation, but not yet yep. in the, okay. All right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so I'm talking about nutrition and the health of indigenous peoples. Uh, but before I talk about that, I'd like to just set, uh, set up a few assumptions. When we talk about nutrition, uh, we talk about it depending on the sector that we've come from. So for example, the health sector has a model of the nutrient as the basic unit of nutrition. And this is a health and disease model system. Uh, you have a deficiency, you identify it through a, a, a chemical or, or a um, clinical measurement. Uh, and you treat it with a nutrient and typically it's single nutrients or, uh, or a tiny subset of, of a couple of different nutrients. Uh, then you have the agriculture sector model of nutrition. Food was that basic unit. Uh, FAO, for example, uh, was long of the view that if you provide the food, everything else follows. We know that's wrong. 
we know that uh, in, uh, in spite of adequacy of food supply and food intake, micronutrient uh, problems uh, existed. And then uh, for when, when we saw the failures of these two, these two, uh, really the only two models uh, that were uh, out there for nutrition, the health and the agriculture sector model, and saw the failures of both of these, uh, it occurred to many that we needed a multi-sectoral -se uh, model uh, and that diet should be that functional basic unit of nutrition. And this actually came out of a um, the work and consultancies that involved the environment sector. And if we look at the diagram below, uh, this is a schematic of oops, the food food system in one of the one of the reports by the high level panel of experts uh, on for the committee on world food security. What what we do. It is very difficult to address in a holistic way the entire food system. So we need to be reductionist to a point. We need to pull out pieces of the food system, evaluate it, and then put it back in, uh, in, in, in the way we uh, evaluate the contribution that nutrients, foods, and diets make uh, to human health uh, and their place within that food system. So one of the accusations that the food composition community hears is uh, it's too reductionist, it is too um, nutritionist uh, as if it were uh, a criticism. Uh, and sometimes it is, sometimes we look at these things in isolation without putting them back in. But the beauty of traditional food systems of indigenous peoples is it is always viewed in that context. So we can analyze it. We can look at individual micro components, but then in the context of indigenous peoples and traditional food systems, we put it back together again. So earlier speakers mentioned these two books. Uh, the, the, the first book in the series that I was involved in is the Indigenous Peoples Food Systems with a subtitle, The Many Dimensions of Culture, Diversity and Environment for Nutrition and Health. And these are the 12 case studies listed uh, on the map. The second book took those same case studies and instead of presenting them individually, it, we pulled it apart for different um, contexts, for public health, for infant nutrition for, uh, for women uh, and for various other aspects of health and well-being. And the subtitle of this next book was uh, Food Systems and Well-Being, Interventions uh, policy and Policies for Healthy Communities. One of the, um, one of the early studies done in Pacific Island communities, and I live in a big Pacific Island, New Zealand, not the biggest, Australia would be the biggest. But back in the 80s and 90s, there were studies done by UNICEF, by WHO, looking at problems in, um, in these Pacific Island communities, one of which was the documented um, problem of vitamin A deficiency manifesting as um, like blindness, Beto spots and even uh, zero ophthalmia leading to blindness in children. So uh, it's so this was a problem. It was a problem that manifested uh, sometime after the uh, industrialization and the um, the westernization of these uh, Pacific Island nations, uh, Micronesia, Polynesia, and Melanesia. So UNICEF was in there supplementing uh, the population, the children mainly, and women, uh, focusing on pregnant women, with vitamin A supplements. Meanwhile, there was a person uh, in Micronesia looking at vitamin A deficiency disorders, uh, understanding that it was very prevalent 
For example, WHO reporting that um, up to 230 million children were affected by vitamin A deficiency disorders. It was uh, causing um, a lot of health problems, including blindness. About half a million people were blind through preventable um, causes like vitamin A deficiency. This is an example of xerophthalmia. It's not very nice to look at. He's, this is keto spots, one of the early manifestations of vitamin A deficiency. And vitamin A deficiency was deemed more prevalent than HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, or malaria. But it was curious the way the health sector was dealing with this and the agriculture sector was not involved at this point. And there even today is what I would call a twisted logic of the disease model of malnutrition where studies are done uh, on vitamin A because it's an easy deficiency to measure, but using vitamin A, measuring it as deficient, treating it as if vitamin A deficiency is the problem when the problem is diet quality. And vitamin A deficiency is simply a marker, an easy marker to measure for determining the, um, the, the poor quality of a diet. So kids are still going blind, people are still suffering. Uh, and the twisted logic from the health sector um, has uh, issued statements like this. Studies have shown that xerophthalmia not only causes blindness, but also affects growth, general morbidity and mortality. So taking it to that disease, the disease instead of the diet, instead of the, the, um, the, the problem with the quality of the diet related to micronutrients. And uh, in this paper saying this very strange statement came out um, just a few months ago, December, 2020. And uh, there was a, a final statement in the paper saying some studies have shown a higher prevalence of xerophthalmia in children suffering from concurrent anemia, which could be related to poor dietary intake of nutrients as a, an aside instead of the basic problem. And one of the reasons we understand this so well in Micronesia is because of the work of, uh, on one of these case studies um, that are presented in these first two books, uh, the work of Lois Engelberger, where she, in this quite famous study now, uh, looked at the biodiversity of banana varieties in the islands uh, and determined their nutrient content. Looking at the Cavendish banana, we all know, which has no micronutrient, no, let's say, pro vitamin A carotenoid content compared to, say, uh, this deeply hued, uh, darkly colored banana, which is very sweet and very delicious, and children especially love it. Uh, and this one has more than 8,000 micrograms per 100 grams of banana. And if we look at how much food you need to meet recommended intake of, uh, of vitamin A, and we look at say the carrot banana, it, it, 50 grams of that banana and, and the requirement for vitamin A is met. You take the Cavendish banana, it's impossible. You could eat a metric ton of it and you still would not meet your nutrient requirement. We can look at uh, something else like orange fleshed sweet potatoes. And this is the biodiversity, not the biotechnology of sweet potatoes. And you've got varieties with very high beta carotene content. Um, and for some of those varieties, it might take as little as 60 grams of sweet potato to meet the requirement. For the pale fleshed uh, varieties, it could take as much as a whole kilo of sweet potatoes to meet your requirement. And if we look at these case studies and we look at the um, generalizations made in the, the second volume on um, health and well being in these uh, traditional um, food systems of indigenous peoples, the, the one overriding um, generalization that we could make is the less ad adherence there is to a traditional diet, the greater the problems of micronutrient deficiencies, diet-related chronic diseases, obesity, et cetera. 
And, uh, and in places like um, Micronesia at the time, we could look at the percentage of intake from, a, from local foods versus imported foods. And for example, in women, 73% of the dietary energy came from imported foods. In children, it was even more, 84%. And, uh, and just like with the Mediterranean diet, the problem is the ability to adhere to, the, to those traditional diets. And, uh, and the problems were fewer in the communities where they had greater adherence, and the problems were many and greater in the communities where they either didn't want to or couldn't adhere to the traditional diet. So there are challenges. And a lot of these challenges come down from above. And they say that in the least developed countries, people don't care about biodiversity. They're much more um, worried about food security and livelihood. So we see that, for example, in that orange line. They say, that biodiversity is not important, even food safety is not important. The focus is food security and livelihoods compared to developed countries where they don't need to focus so much on livelihoods or food security and, and, um, and they can focus more attention on food safety issues and biodiversity. We challenged that. We didn't think it was necessarily valid. And that was proven uh, in a, uh, in, in a it was an Afrofoods meeting. Afrofoods, one of the regional data centers within InFoods. And at one of the meetings, uh, some time ago now, uh, 11 years ago, there was um, a call of, for action from the door of return, returning to a food renaissance in Africa. This was very symbolically held at the door of no return at the House of the Slaves on, on Gori Island. And there were a number of resolutions and recommendations at that meeting, and I will read uh, a few of them. They noted that the degradation of ecosystems and the loss of food biodiversity contributed greatly to increases in poverty and malnutrition in Africa. They recognized that returning to local crops and traditional food systems is a prerequisite for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity for food and nutrition. They acknowledged that local foods are the basis for African sustainable diets. First time ever in an FAO document, sustainable diets as a term was used. They urged that food composition data be emphasized as the fundamental information underpinning almost all activities in the field of nutrition. And they called upon the sectors of public health, agriculture, and the environment and food trade to help reinforce and assist with the improvement of food composition data, particularly on local foods. And Afrofoods was represented by people of a number of different uh, indigenous communities. And uh, back to Pacific Island countries, the, uh, the third edition of the Pacific Island Food Composition Tables is under development right now, but the second edition alone already had seven different varieties of taro, six varieties of yams, a lot of local fruit um, that is not necessarily found elsewhere, local nuts, local beans, uh, local green leafy vegetables, and even traditional recipes. In addition, it had a lot of the foods that are part of the um, agricultural surplus of developed countries being dumped in um, Pacific Island nations like mutton flaps, from Australia and New Zealand, and turkey tails from Canada and the US. These foods are um, very high in fat and are popular foods, very inexpensive, and are contributing to the public health crises uh, in Pacific Island countries. Uh, just some other foods, wild animal foods are also included in the um, Pacific Island food composition databases, uh, crocodile, pig, insects, even worms and ants. And I just want to um, talk a little bit about dilemmas and trade-offs. When we talk about traditional food systems of indigenous peoples and the, um, the, the role of underutilized uh, and wild foods, 
and also the role of meat, we have to um, make a few assumptions. One of those assumptions is that all food systems are sustainable potentially. If they weren't, there would not be people living in those food systems. They would not have been thriving for millennia before uh, industrialization of food systems. So if we look at animal foods and, uh, and we understand that animal foods are important in the diet of many um, communities, indigenous communities, uh, we cannot afford to make blanket statements like the world need or, or, or the whole world needs to decrease consumption of meat and dairy. Uh, the dilemmas are that meat and dairy are rich sources of nutrients, but they, in many places, high intakes increase risk for non-communicable diseases. They contribute to deforestation in many places, uh, but they are natural repositories of plant biodiversity, the grazing pastures, natural, um, the natural uh, grazing lands of livestock in many parts of the world. And that plant biodiversity in forage crops, natural, naturally um, occurring, are part of that uh, kind of synergistic sustainability and their great global carbon sinks and contribute to, to the global uh, carbon balances. There are uh, pasture um, species are fibrous, humans can't eat them, ruminants uh, and, uh, and other grazing animals can. And therefore, we, um, the de declaration was made at the second scientific symposium on biodiversity uh, and sustainable diets uh, using livestock as the example, that we need to look to the context and the context, whether we're talking about us in our diets or traditional food systems uh, of indigenous people, that context has to be the ecosystem. And the essence of sustainable diets is an ecosystem approach. And the importance of indigenous food systems to food security will only be realized when more compositional data are generated, compiled, and disseminated. And that includes not just the foods that people are eating, but also the ecosystem um, and ecosystem services that allow that food to be there. And the example in Mongolia at this uh, Human Nutrition and Livestock Symposium was, uh, was the mint species. The gra they are grazing, the, these indigenous horse um, species are grazing on pasture uh, that gives them, um, together with the genetic trait of that species, uh, the ability to have um, the N minus three fatty acids in there, in the meat and in the, um, in the milk. And it is that ecosystem, not just the animal, not just the pasture, but the combination of everything and all the ecosystem services that allow the population to meet its nutrient requirements and to attain um, a sustainable diet. You change one thing in that context, and it does affect the nutrients um, that are available for consumption. One minute left. Okay, uh, I would encourage everybody who's interested in the um, uh, indigenous people's food systems to study uh, the Samoa pathway. It provides um, useful policy advice for among other things, getting funds to undertake food composition analysis to populate national food composition databases with local foods. And I would like to credit the um, indigenous peoples with um, one of the most important things that has brought um, the context of ecosystem and planetary health to our um, scientific community. And this is, comes out of Bolivia. It's a law, the law of the rights of mother nature to water, to clean air, to equilibrium, to restoration, to the diversity of life and to life itself. And I, uh, one of the recommendations that I hope 
uh, comes out of the, the um, food system summit is to revise the universal declaration of human rights to include a lot of these dimensions. And it's the International Year of Fruit and Vegetables. So uh, let's eat some local healthy fruits and vegetables. That's it from me. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. So uh, for this uh, very inspiring uh, talk, um, yes, you are always very inspiring and have always been. And I think you are the mother of uh, biodiversity and nutrition within uh, FAO and uh, everybody recognizes you for that one. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, let's go to our last uh, talk. Uh, and I would like to give uh, the floor to Longban. Thank you. I will be talking about the inventory of indigenous foods from Northeast India and their composition. But this is a very big topic, so I will be just touching upon many things. Um, Longma, we don't see your screen yet. I don't know I have put up my screen. No, not I, yet. We don't see, see it. It's still black. Oh, I don't know. Can you see it? Perfect now. Thank you. Great. Sorry. <clears throat> that was the wrong stuff. Well, I will be talking about the indigenous foods from Northeast India and their composition. But since this is a very big topic, I will be just touching upon many aspects of this. Uh, about the land, the Northeast India comprises of eight small states where about 240 indigenous people uh, live there. Each of them have a distinct social, cultural, and linguistic variability. Northeast India also accounts for 7.9% of the total area of the country, but accounts for 25% of the total forest cover. The region falls under the Indo-Burma center of many species. It is now identified as one of the 34 biodiversity hotspots of the world. The land ownership and management system is very unique in Northeast India. Because under the Indian constitution, the indigenous people in India are of Northeast are the owners of the land and its natural resources. For example, I tend to talk about the state in Nagaland. In the state of Nagaland, all the land is owned by the people. The government owns only 6% of the forest land. The local customary laws govern the land holdings, community forest management system. Uh, and is the primary mode of forest conservation and the main thing in guarding the region's immense biodiversity. Uh, typical land use types and resources. This is of one tribe, that is the Khasis in Meghalaya. They have the reserve forest, where the, which is considered as the main regulator of ecosystem functions and services. In this reserve forest, we will find about 750 plus uh, species, many of which are used as plant, uh, as food sources. Then you have the mixed farm and forest, there's the farm habitat and breeding ground for wild animals. Here you have about 559 plus uh, species, many of which are again the uh, used as foods. Now the typical agricultural system is the June cultivation, June, which is the shifting cultivation. This provides all the foods for the, uh, most of the foods that are cultivated. Uh, in total, it uh, gives about 99 or, you know, plus about, depending on the tribe, from 60 to 100 foods. There are no, no, we have looked at the Northeast India, there are so many uh, tribes yet. 
we have not seen any systematic uh, conglomeration of all the foods that are available. So we did a systematic review to determine the number of foods that are available. Of the 200, we found 267 published papers. In this, you know, wild plants food were used by all the types, but the species usage depended on their geographical location and ecology. Hence, it is not uniform among the tribes. Varieties of uh, wild species are included in all the food count, but here in uh, the food count that we have made, we have not given the varieties within the uh, species. For example, there are more than 200 taro varieties that have been documented by research, aggregate research station in Northeast India. So if you look at the, uh, the food groups, you see the cereals, millets, the green leafy vegetables tops the list with different types of uh, green leafy vegetables that are collected from the forest. Then, the, then you have the fruits, then you have the insects, the aquatic uh, species, and fruits. So you see a variety of fruits, wherein we could count about 1,981 fruits. Uh, in a systematic study of one of the tribes, that is the Chakazans in uh, Nagaland, we have uh, found that they, uh, they know about 614 foods that are used in their diet. The, the only problem is that most of these foods are now, they may have the knowledge, but the consumption is much, much lower. So if you look at the wild one that is, that is in the green and the cultivated one that is, sorry, wild one that is in the red, and the cultivated ones in the green, you will find that the wild food uh, resources are plenty. So where does the food come from the, for these indigenous people in Northeast India? First, the agricultural system, that is the shifting cultivation. This continues to be the most dominant mode of food production and mainstay for the economy of, and the food security of the people in Northeast India. Uh, then comes the parishions, but in this particular, it is mainly the rice that is grown and, of course, uh, the uh, wetlands that provide the natural habitat, breathing and environment for the varieties of aquatic forms. What is more important is the forest. Forest plays a very important role in augmenting the food supplies of the indigenous people and they are intricately linked to the forest. Uh, many generations have been uh, relying on the uh, forest for their foods. And actually, the, the, uh, there is a deep understanding of the ecosystem, seasonality, availability of resources, and its collection with minimal intervention of the ecosystem. Uh, so what is the nutritional importance of uh, shifting cultivation? You see, the June fields are filled with crop uh, land races that are diverse, locally adapted, associated with farmers' practice of seed selection and management. Uh, in mixed cropping system, which is practiced in the shifting cultivation, soil exhausting crops like rice, maize, millets are grown along with soil enriching crops like the legumes. In any given village, you will find 65 to 90 crops that are cultivated in the, in the June fields, thus providing dietary diversity to the people. These crops are harvested at different time points, thereby providing the farmers sequential harvesting and a variety of foods through the year. So relatively, uh, the principal crops, that is the cereals and tubers occupy 70%, the intermediate crops occupy 10%, 20%, and the minor crops occupy 10% of a typical jungle. Now, if you look at the indigenous uh, cereals and millets, what comes first from the June field is the maize. The maize is the first to come it starts uh, coming sometime in uh, May, June, and then this provides the uh, food source for the people. The next, when the, uh, when the rice is running low, comes the millets. Different types of millets are used there, the foxtail millet, the finger millet. These are the main uh, types of millet, other types of um, minor millets are also used. The millets are a source of protein as well as minerals. Then, of course, the buckwheat is used in the Himalayan, uh, upper Himalayan region, uh, but its usage is confined to the uh, higher uh, levels. Uh, here, you, you may also find the job steers. Job steers is an excellent source of protein, 16%, and fat, 7%. Uh, 
There are two types of uh, job steers that are normally consumed by the people, the, uh, but the smaller variety of which has lower protein. Then, of course, you have the sticky rice, the black sticky rice, the red sticky rice, and the uh, white sticky rice, which are used during different festivals and functions, as well as in snacks. Uh, known as India actually has the greatest diversity uh, because rice diversity is uh, found only in the, from the northeast to southeast China. At least 10,000 rice indigenous rice varieties are uh, supposed to be present in northeast India alone. The diverse uh, rice landrises that is grown in subsistence agriculture are diverse and generally carry a great amount of genetic variability, which are extremely important for providing genetic resources to meet the current and new challenges for farming in stressful environment and for crop improvement. We have carried out a study on the, uh, the rice land races from Northeast India, 144 uh, varieties from different states of Northeast India. Consistently, we found a significantly higher levels of to total dietary fiber uh, as compared to the high yielding varieties that were developed in the green revolution. And when we looked at the glycemic index, we found that all the uh, high yielding varieties had high glycemic index, whereas the, all the uh, rice land races that were collected from Northeast India and studied had low glycemic index. So this assumes importance in a, in a world where the uh, diabetes is rising every day. Now, among the cultivated crops, when we look at the crops, we see the sweet potato. Sweet potato is normally consumed by children, uh, and it is actually not uh, very important as a food source in Northeast India. It is normally given for uh, livestock feed. What is uh, unique about the Northeast India is the Fermi Lamindia vestida. This is a tuber that is grown in the jungles and consumed raw. This is starchy and has a sweet flavor. A very versatile plant is the sejun include where the fruit is consumed as well as the tuber, as well as the leaves. So when uh, in season, the fruits and the leaves are consumed, when out of season, the tubers are consumed. What uh, we see is, in, but the more, most important crop tubers is the Colocasia esculenta. More than 200 land races are reported to be present in Northeast India, but only 110 has been documented so far. This is grown in uh, June fields, and actually, if uh, you look at the uh, taro, a single taro can weigh as much as 5.4 kg. Now, if you look at the indigenous grain legumes, uh, I am showing you only those that are, you know, indigenous to the to the region. We have the uh, Soybean, which is which has a small variety, the medium size and the big size. In India, soybean is consumed only in Northeast India and that too in a fermented form. We have another very important uh, crop that is the rice beans. The rice beans can have small uh, size, big, medium size, big size, and different in seed, uh, seed covers. Also, we have the tree beans. Tree beans is this is a leguminous uh, tree, so it fixes nitrogen to the soil. It uh, gives you timber and it gives you food. It is consumed right from the immature state to the mature state. And the beans, the best part of this beans is it does not have any uh, nutritional inhibitors and it is normally consumed raw. We have the traditional oil seed, uh, that is the uh, perilla fructosins, which has high protein and fat. Also, the, what is important is the iron and zinc content plus the uh, Content of alpha linolenic acid, the omega 3 fatty acids. The, the leaves are also consumed from this plant. Now, various indigenous uh, vegetables that blends uh, and gives a flavor to the curry. That, for example, if you look at the uh, solenum varieties, all these are very uh, important and uh, accepted choices of uh, the people. But what is important is solenum via skin. This is bitter but preferred by the people and very good in controlling hypertension. Uh, the, the bamboo shoot is consumed throughout the uh, Northeast. Hundreds of varieties are present. It is consumed in the raw form or in the fermented form. 
We also have the cultivated spices, the alien, the, the leaves uh, are consumed during season, during off season, the roots are consumed, which is starchy and it still retains the flavor of this uh, alien bukri. Also the, uh, the alien depression and the, and the alien chanasi. What is the uh, unique about this place is also the Eshodzia planta, which is a plant that is uh, that resembles more like a mint, but very different from mint in the smell. This is used by the people right from the initial stage uh, until the inflorescence matures, and this dried inflorescence is also kept for use during off season. Varieties of chilies are uh, cultivated there. 52 Capsicum land races has been uh, distinguished based on their uh, morphological appearance, flavor, and pungency. What is unique again is this hate. This grows about 8 to 10 inches long and it grows only in one village. When taken out from this village, it does not grow properly or it does not fruit properly. The fruits become very small. Other uh, varieties is the, the it's a very spicy, very spicy uh, chilies that are there. But what, uh, again, you have the you know the fireball which is very hot, and then um, you have the bird eye chili. But the most important one again is another king chili, uh, which is considered the hottest chili in the world. Uh, wild spices and condiments are also used in many ways. These are uh, used in the raw form as well as in the uh, in the dry form. Well, what again I want to stress upon is this grass similarity. This inflorescence matures into this fruit, the, the small, small seeds. And this, once it is dried, it is uh, powdered, and then the testa is taken off. Uh, this is used for all stomach elements. It is also used for allergy, and it is also used for controlling hypertension. When we analyze this, we found at normal to be high levels of malic acid, 1.4 grams per 100 grams. We also found tartaric acid and succinic acid. Now, wild green vegetables, again, hundreds of wild green vegetables are consumed in Norris, but many of them have the therapeutic values. For example, clerotendron and coliprogenum, this is used for controlling hypertension. It is also vegetable. It is also very unique vegetable used for controlling hypertension. Another one is the plantago major, which is again a vegetable, but it's fresh leaves and only grounded and put in wounds to stop the, uh, to en enable healing. Most of these uh, green leaf vegetables are also a very good source of beta carotene. Now, wild fruits, hundreds of wild fruits are there that are found throughout the year. Different wild fruits, uh, you know, maturing at different times, a source of food, a uh, source of vitamins. But most importantly, again, that there are the uh, wild fruits which have therapeutic values. For example, the uh, iris calcida. This again is used for controlling sugar um, uh, among the diabetes. Ripple wild mushrooms, plenty. And uh, in any uh, place, the only problem with edible wild mushroom is in the scientific identification. This provides a source of uh, protein as well as a source of vitamin D2. But my favorite is always this picture, which has uh, the mushroom uh, as big as a child, but unidentified. Now, a lot of insects are used, varieties of insects, larvae are used. This also provides a source of protein, uh, fat, and minerals. So also the nutritional benefits that come from the petty ecofill system. What is more important is the, the uh, snails, the Brotia postula and the Bellamia pangolensis. What we found was that uh, the ecosap antenoic acid and docosahexoic acid, the long chain entry fatty acid content can be as high as 70 to 10 percent of the total fatty acid. Now, what is that uh, that we want to see? With the food system of the indigenous people in the we know that the uh, food biodiversity is the key to food security, education, nutrition, and health. And this is, of course, reflected in the nutritional status of some of the indigenous people in Northeast India. However, many of the food used by the indigenous people have therapeutic values, but unfortunately, lack of scientific data prevents most of it from being leveraged as its full potential to contribute 
to sustainable development. Forest policies, of course, have uh, discouraged the people from uh, June cultivation, but they, they have uh, actually not really helped the people because promotion of settled agriculture by the government, agriculture department, to promote the common vegetables for commercialization or plantation crops that has come up. This has come up at the cost of regenerative fallows that would otherwise have regrown into secondary forests. And this has actually led to a loss of vital ecosystem services and land degradation. From being self-reliant, the indigenous people in North India are becoming more and more dependent on government's social security programs, like the previous public discipline system, which gives five figure rights to each individual, ICDS, etc. etc. However, most of these schemes and programs introduced by the government have not adequately addressed the security needs of the June farmers. Their need for cash to educate the children, increase assets, and enhance the purchasing power. Then what is more important is with increasing exposure to the outside world, there's rising aspirations within the communities, and this shifting cultivators to desire change and are seeking options that will help them to assimilate into the mainstream economy. The markets of uh, the impact of markets on indigenous people food system has brought about noticeable change in their lives and livelihood, pushing the indigenous foods and leading to the consumption of high fat, high sugar, and followed by a rise in rising incidence of NCDs in the region. Therefore, recognition of the indigenous people's food system of Northeast India as a key to food and nutrition and food and nutrition security can help protect and strengthen the food system. Research actually is urgently required and needed on the indigenous food system with active engagement of the indigenous people to demonstrate the potential of the traditional food system to support the ecosystem and sustainable food and nutrition security to drive sustainable policies in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Longva. It's uh, it's so impressive uh, which kind of foods are out there, and uh, they are increasingly known apparently. So that is really nice. Um, so before going to the uh, uh, question and answers, I would really like to thank uh, each of the um, presenters for excellent and inspiring um, presentations. Uh, each of them bringing some different aspects of indigenous people's foods and uh, their implication for whatever. So, uh, and for the uh, food system, for the health, for the, uh, for the agriculture, for, for culture. And uh, it's, it's really so rich and it's, it's inspiring. And, um, and um, yeah, one would really like to taste many of these foods uh, which we have seen on photos and uh, which we were talking about. And uh, yes, it's a pity that they are not that much available. Um, and I also would like to thank uh, Sol Ruiz, uh, who is helping us uh, from uh, the technical side uh, for this seminar. And I would like to thank uh, all the uh, participants. We have uh, 61 participants uh, out of uh, the 150 registered. And uh, let me go now uh, through the questions uh, that we have received. Um, one question is, how do you define high source and low uh, when you talk uh, about uh, the, for the nutrients? And this is, was for Jennifer. Thank you, yes, for the question. Um, I, I have defined this, um, following the Codex Alimentarius guidelines for food labeling. And uh, actually I've pasted in the link in the, in the chat there where the question was asked. And uh, the reference nutrient values for deciding what was high and low were taken from uh, the EU regulation, uh, an EU regulation that was uh, published in 2011. Okay, thank you. Um, also, another question for you, Jennifer. How to deal with different local names of indigenous foods? 
and how to link them with scientific names. Yes, I mean, this is a uh, very challenging work. Absolutely, it is very detailed and, and challenging work. And, and it's a concern uh, for that to be a barrier to uh, publishing the information. Uh, but certainly it requires <clears throat> botanical knowledge. We need to study uh, the, the, the local botany. There are some online resources and communities that can help to identify plants if you share uh, the, the photos of the, of the plant and, and some experts and, and people that are very passionate about plant identification can support the identification based on photos in those forums. So I think if, if you're having trouble identifying the foods in your, in your food systems, you could reach out to those uh, online communities uh, or, or to local uh, universities and experts of botany in, in your regions, uh, because the identification is, is quite important to ensure that this information is connecting into the, the greater body of knowledge uh, about these plants. Although if you're using the foods only very locally and the information only needs to be relevant at the local level, then uh, perhaps you can just proceed with the, the local names. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, probably then to Longwa, the same question, you have presented a lot of these scientific names. So how did you manage to do that? Longwa, yeah. Okay, I'm gone, I'm gone. Actually, uh, I found uh, most of this uh, scientific name when I went to the Botanical Survey of India. Again, there are also so many uh, published papers who, and they have also given the scientific name of many of the uh, species that they have collected. So that's how we started collecting and we could uh, reach 1,981 foods that had scientific identification. There were many foods that did not have scientific identification which we could not take because it was given in the local name. And the, 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 as I said, 240 tribes are there in Northeast India. And each local name differs one from the other. Another way of uh, looking at it is by looking at the picture. If you look at the picture and you find a similar picture, perhaps this is also a lead for you to know what the species is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, because this is uh, when you want to do publications or writing articles, especially also on the content, um, you are very often required to give the scientific name. So, uh, not having the scientific name it can be a hinderstone for a publication of the results. And um, talking about uh, analysis, um, a question for Longvine and probably, uh, yes, for, for others as well. Um, normally, indigenous plants have a very short harvest time, and uh, this limits uh, sometimes the sampling and therefore the analysis of uh, the uh, of the different indigenous foods. Um, how many uh, samples, uh, different samples, do you suggest should be in uh, in a pooled sample uh, for analyzing in order to get high quality data out of? Like I have already said, in the, in the shifting cultivation, all these plants that are cultivated have different uh, life, short time. So therefore, the, the, it ripens at different time points, thereby providing uh, food security and nutrient security to the people, one. Number two, about the, uh, the foods, yes, it has short life, but if you collect about four samples, and then make it into a composite sample for analysis, because you cannot analyze four samples differently for the same study due to cost. Then we should take at least four samples from different places, make it into a composite sample, and then analyze, which should be very acceptable to you. Okay, so if I understand correctly, you put four different, uh, some of the white vegetables into one sample and analyze it as a composite sample. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And um, then we have uh, some other questions of um, 
how uh, do indigenous people appreciate or value um, these uh, foods, their local foods, uh, if they don't know how nutritious they are, or even if they know how nutritious they are, do they value them, them more and eat them more? And this is probably a question to, uh, to all the presenters. So what is your experience? In Northeast India, actually the foods are preferred because of their dietary preferences. And uh, the, the, the way they use the foods for different, in different combination in making a dish. That's, that is the reason why the wild uncultivated vegetables or plant foods or other foods are still being in use because of the dietary preferences of the people. Without even knowing whether they are nutritious or whether they have, you know, other forms of uh, things there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can somebody add something for other parts of the world? Barbara? Uh, we have a different a uh, set of uh, stories in some Pacific Island countries where uh, sometimes the youth reject the local foods. Uh, they prefer the, uh, the imported, the convenience foods, the fast foods. Uh, but one story I liked so much uh, during, the, uh, during the intensive work on the, um, that Biodiversity Jeff funded program uh, of uh, the four countries was in Brazil. It was a story that a woman told. Uh, she was deep in the Amazon jungle. She said uh, she would go there frequently. They used to give the honored guests, and she was one, uh, Coca-Cola uh, as the beverage uh, and uh, not the local fruit juices. Uh, because they didn't think they were valued. Uh, and then one day she brought them a publication from the Journal of Food Composition and Analysis showing the, um, the very high content of these beneficial bioactive components in the Amazonian fruits. They didn't know what anthocyanins were or resveratrol or any of these other components, um, but, th but she said, they were beneficial, they were great. So from that point onward, this elder, when he greeted visitors um, arriving deep into the Amazon, he would give them the local fruit juice uh, and he would tell them uh, the, the uh, nutrient content, how, how beneficial it was. Uh, and he was very, very proud of those local fruits and the fruit juices from that point onward, really not understanding what the, um, the names of the uh, components were or anything, but uh, knowing, just knowing that they were important, they were beneficial and that they were valued and known internationally. I, so I thought that was a charming uh, kind of story um, related to somebody appreciating nutrient content, even not understanding fully um, the, the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anne? No, uh, thank you so much for, for this question. I just uh, wanted to say that this is an issue that really uh, came st strongly from the white paper that we have been uh, collaborating with, the, with many indigenous peoples from the, across the world. Um, and uh, what came out is that we need interculturality in policy making uh, in terms of uh, school feeding programs or uh, includes interculturality in, uh, in education for indigenous youth or um, so that they got more aware about their traditional foods and the nutritional values um, and also raising awareness uh, for indigenous adults or parents uh, because we see um, how uh, school feeding programs, for example, are really um, uh, changing the, the, the taste uh, preference of indigenous uh, youth. Um, and also when doing the profiling exercises with indigenous communities, what came strongly for one case for the Melanesian one is that this exercise helps the community to really reflect on their food system and how, and they got more aware about how traditional knowledge was lost over the past uh, decades. And so it really catalyzed uh, from what I, I read from the profile, the 
with the wish to uh, revigorate uh, the transmission of traditional knowledge between the elders and the youth. And so, um, so we are working very on this on the white paper in order to uh, to really uh, pass the idea uh, in the context of the UN Food System Summit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jennifer, you would like to add something on that or? Um, certainly, I mean, I think that there are quite a number of reflections from the different food systems where we saw, in many cases, still a very high value on the traditional foods. I can think of the, the Baca hunter-gatherers in Cameroon who, who I, with whom I participated in the profiling, and for them, the bush meat and the, and the foods from the forest are absolutely essential, and they, they have uh, a word for hunger that is specific to bushmeat. So they have two words for hunger and one is, is for they're hungry for bushmeat and one is that they're hunger, hungry in general. And so that food cannot be replaced in their food system. And, uh, and there's, it's still one of the most preferred foods uh, for them. And, and this was seen in, in a lot of the different food systems that were included in, in that profile that the, that the, traditional foods are still very much valued. Although in other sites, we do see some, uh, some tendency to be shifting more towards foods from, from the market. Uh, yes, so mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what comes to mind immediately. Thank you. Yeah, and at the beginning, uh, I don't know if it was Jennifer or Anne who said that uh, uh, a lot of indigenous people ask uh, Bao and your unit to analyze foods. Why do they want to analyze the foods for the composition? Um, I wish Jan were here because I think this is really from his experience through uh, many consultations in seminars at FAO, like the high level uh, seminar that was held on indigenous people's food systems in 2018 and earlier consultations in 2015. Um, I, I think that it, it's that people are curious to know the nutritional values. And as we've seen, they're not always well covered in, in national databases. Um, perhaps uh, Anne or, or other speakers have, have more to add on this. Amara, I see. yeah. <laughs> In, in New Zealand uh, and in Pacific Island countries, they typically want the analyses if they intend to export. They need those nutrient composition data for different export markets. Mm -hmm. Well, this is good news and bad news. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, then we have uh, another question to uh, Longmar. You said that uh, there were um, 748 cereals uh, identified in the north. Are these species and priorities or do they include dishes? Because it's a real high number. Um, I'm sorry, I did not mention it in the lot of time. There are rice varieties, mostly. Mostly? Mostly land races. It's really it's impressive uh, how many land races uh, are still in the area. And uh, you uh, presented as well uh, a lot of other different cereals which are still used. And uh, yes, it's really impressive of, uh, of the variety and diversity of uh, the indigenous foods that you have presented. And um, the question you were often referring to some of the content uh, that were analyzed. Uh, are these um, uh, compositional data publicly available? Some are publicly available. Some we are we are actually compiling them. We we are planning to release a book on the nutrient composition. Perhaps we have uh, the database for about three hundred to three hundred fifty foods. So this we we are compiling right now. Wow, it's an amazing amount of, uh, of data that you have, and they are all analytical. And if I know you well enough, uh, you have not only analyzed the proximates, but you have analyzed the, the vitamins and minerals and uh, phytochemicals as well. Yes, 
Actually, that is the reason why I was talking about the Rasse Meyer, like a small seeds, which were used as, uh, you know, for any stomach ailment or allergy or, you know, reducing the hypertension and the organic acid content, which was actually very strange because no, no other food has such high malic acid, as much as 1.4 grams per 100 grams. Mm -hmm. Extremely yeah. high. So yes, this that, makes sense. That has some, something to do with its therapeutic uh, values. Yes. So this makes them so special. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are coming to the end of uh, our uh, workshop. And I would like to ask everybody to make uh, a final remark. May I start with uh, Anne? No, I mean, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this webinar. It was very interesting and I was very much pleased to present uh, the work of the unit and the purpose and objective of the Global Hub. So really hope to, to continue the, the collaboration with Infood in this context. And uh, I would like to thank uh, you, Ruth, and all the panelists because it was very extremely interesting and very inspiring for the way forward. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Ruth, uh, for the invitation to present in this seminar. Um, it has been, as, as Anne said, a, a very enriching and interesting uh, seminar. It's been uh, absolutely inspiring to hear the, the, the knowledge shared by Barbara and Longma, uh, the deep knowledge on Indigenous peoples' uh, food systems and the composition and the relevance of the, the nutritional composition data in uh, also in better informing and, and using the, these indigenous foods. Um, yes, I, I, I hope that the, the presentation that I gave can, can show really the relevance of doing more work always on nutritional composition information in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Barbara. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, for Indigenous peoples and traditional food systems, I think uh, Indigenous peoples are the guardians of food biodiversity. They are the, the keepers of ecosystems. Uh, and if we want a sustainable future, we have to be informed by the past. And by the past, it is those traditional food systems of indigenous peoples that can lead us to um, hopefully restoration of, of the planet and a future with sustainable diets and sustainable food systems. So indigenous peoples studying that in the context of many different disciplines, but particularly food composition is essential. Mm -hmm. Nice message. Long run. What is your message? Well, you see, for me, I think uh, the you know the indigenous, indigenous people around the world are being exposed to globalization. Each of these uh, indigenous people group have rising aspirations, and you know they want to assimilate into the mainstream economy. This actually is going to hamper the sustainability of the indigenous people's food system, which we today recognize as very important for food and nutrient security. And I think uh, today's topic that uh, we have uh, discussed on various things, actually uh, our take home message would be to really look into the sustainability of the indigenous people's food system and how we can help in doing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much uh, to all the presenters for their inspiring uh, presentations and uh, last words. And again, thank you so much for the participants and their uh, questions and uh, to Sol for her uh, um, help in organizing um, this uh, meeting. So with that one, I would like to close and, um, and uh, wish that uh, this food system will continue existing over the next thousand years and uh, the foods that we know today 
will not vanish, but uh, that they will continue being and being consumed and appreciated. And much more of the composition will be known and publicly available. So with this one, uh, thank you again to everybody. And uh, with this one, we will close our uh, seminar, our webinar on indigenous peoples and their food composition. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.